Welcome to Neuropraxis Family and Friends, a TBI Survivor Support Group Week 1 module. In this module, we'll be covering tips in managing challenging TBI behaviors and cognitive deficits. We kindly ask that you complete this survey code by scanning the QR code or accessing the link in the description box below. It will only take about one minute and will gather your baseline knowledge before moving on to the educational portion of this module. Following this module, you'll have a general understanding of brain injury diagnosis, common TBI behaviors, cognitive deficits and their causes, and lastly, an understanding of techniques that can help manage these deficits and behaviors with their loved one. In this section, we'll provide a general overview of the two types of brain injuries that fall under the umbrella term of an acquired brain injury. An acquired brain injury is defined as a trauma to the brain that is not caused by genetics or trauma and that occurs before birth. In essence, this kind of brain damage is one that started after birth. The damage alters the neuronal networks of the brain that negatively affects the physical health of the brain and body, which in turn results in reduced cognitive and physical abilities of the brain injury survivor. Now we'll go over what a traumatic brain injury entails. There are two types of TBI known as closed and open head injuries. Closed head injuries are trauma to the brain without causing an opening to the skull. They are common and whiplash type injuries caused by car accidents, motorcycle accidents, bicycle accidents, falls, and blows to the head during a fight, and the most commonly from concussions that occur in contact sports. Open head injuries are trauma that occurs with opening to the skull. This can be caused by objects entering the skull or internal objects that penetrate the brain, such as wounds caused by weapons, bone fragments, or extreme force from an accident or object. Non-traumatic brain injury is a medical term when the brain tissues are injured by internal objects. This is most common in heart attacks that cause a lack of oxygen to the heart, strokes that cause a lack of blood flow to the brain, poisoning, near drowning experiences, pressure from brain tumors, sudden and extreme widening or rupture of the brain's blood vessels known as aneurysms, and serious infection of the brain such as meningitis. Here's an image of what a non-traumatic brain injury may entail. There are three levels of brain injury that are diagnosed by how long one loses consciousness and how long symptoms occur post-injury. Specifically, mild severity type is the most common diagnosis of brain injury and usually caused by concussions. This is characterized by confusion and loss of consciousness for less than 30 minutes with post-traumatic amnesia, which may last up to 24 hours. Medical professionals also use the Glasgow Coma Scale to provide brain injury diagnosis and mild TBI falls within 13 points or more on the Glasgow Coma Scale. Moderate TBI is characterized by loss of consciousness, confusion, disorientation for 30 minutes or up to 24 hours, accompanied by post-traumatic amnesia that can last between 24 hours to a week. Lastly, severe brain injury is diagnosed with the Glasgow Coma Scale of 9 or less or following unconsciousness that lasts longer than 24 hours memory loss or post-traumatic amnesia that persists for more than a week. In this section, we'll go over common TBI behaviors and their causes. Although not an extensive list of TBI behaviors, as there can be a multitude of different behaviors associated with TBI, we have listed the most common system seen in the rehab setting. Specifically within social contexts, Inappropriate sexual behaviors like exposing oneself or saying vulgar comments are common, in addition to using rude or offensive language, not understanding social cues or social norms like taking turns, staying on topic, or interrupting others is common. Even the onset of anxiety of social events can occur due to self-awareness of these deficits and the fear of judgment from those who don't understand what brain injury entails. Emotional repercussions following brain injury can include onset of depression, low mood, consistent worry, anger outbursts, destruction of objects, or self-harming behaviors. It is also common for those suffering from a brain injury to lose motivation to do things they enjoyed previously or find motivation to complete daily tasks like showering or household chores. If diagnosed prior to injury, mental health symptoms or personality disorder symptoms may become worse. Lastly, 
Brain injury can bring on deficits in self-awareness, such as controlling one's impulses like excessive shopping, eating too much, or saying inappropriate comments. This can also lead to engaging in risky behaviors like excessive alcohol consumption, drug addiction, sex addiction, or even criminal offenses. Some survivors are unaware of the extent of their injuries and their physical and cognitive consequences. Thus, they may not be aware that these behaviors are negatively affecting their relationships. This is usually present during the very early stages of recovery, but it can persist throughout the recovery process. Now we'll go over a general overview of common TBI cognitive deficits and their roots. Again, this is not an extensive list as you may witness other types of cognitive deficits in your loved one. Memory is commonly impaired following a brain injury and can look like forgetting to brush your teeth or remembering to eat throughout the day, or even forgetting the names of their children and close friends. Impaired attention is very common with TBI survivors during recovery. This can look like the inability to focus on one task at a time, trying to juggle too many things at once, difficulty starting a task or completing what they started because they're easily distracted by sound or people entering the room. Remembering the correct order of steps, following their favorite dinner recipe, or even forgetting the sequence of events are signs of impaired sequencing skills following a brain injury. Additionally, being unable to organize their daily events without help can occur like knowing what to do with their time when everyone is gone for work, an inconsistent sleep schedule, or consistently forgetting doctor's appointments. Difficulty in problem solving, such as cooking without burning themselves or determining their monthly budget can become difficult. Being unable to make decisions based on all the available information, like following driving rules or baking a cake with the instructions. Lastly, communication deficits, like finding the words to express themselves, consistently experiencing tip of the tongue moments, and requiring additional time to understand spoken or written communication is common. Behavior can be triggered or influenced by outside occurrences as well. Looking at potential physical, emotional, environmental, or even um, medicinal related influences can help you determine the roots of these behaviors. As we go through each category, take a mental note or physically write down any areas you think your loved one may have sensitivity to. Physical symptoms like pain or having a UTI can make your loved one feel um, easily irritated or confused. Some survivors may even be sensitive to sound known as hyperacusis, or the summer months may even be more unbearable as their bodies have a harder time regulating heat. Even the emotional state of others can trigger a negative behavior such as a furrowed brow, or an intense tone or tense body language from another person may make, may make a survivor feel on edge and can easily trigger negative emotions. Most importantly, some survivors may take several medications to manage pain, sleep, and mental health disorders, all of which may come with side effects. Knowing the timing of each medication and their side effects can help you identify when your loved one will become drowsy or irritable throughout the specific times of the day. Here we will provide an overview of what damage to certain brain regions can look like in everyday life. Damage to the temporal lobe can result in impaired hearing, difficulty understanding spoken language, being unable to pinpoint what they are seeing and hearing in the moment, or needing help recalling past memories and reduced capacity for the brain to store new memories. Occipital lobe damage can result in complete blindness um, in certain parts of the areas of visual field, seeing things that are not there, or unable to see finer details like being able to see differences in shapes or letters that can make writing and reading difficult. The pituitary gland controls the hormones in our body and is an important region of vital functions that keep us healthy. Damage to this brain area can result in blood pressure issues, low desire for sex, low energy, constant feeling of sadness, experiencing drastic changes in body temperature, or fluctuations in weight. Damage to the hypothalamus can also lead to low desire for sex. This can also result in insomnia or unable to achieve adequate sleep, weight gain, and issues in hormone balance. Injury to the amygdala can lead to emotional disturbances such as anger outbursts, extreme feeling of fear, worry, and extreme overreaction to non-threatening experiences. If one sustains damage to the hippocampus, this can result in confusion, consistent fluctuation in mood, 
being unable to remember their way home from their daily walk, and misplacing items consistently. The frontal lobe is known as the center for higher level cognitive functions, such as problem solving, social skills, some movements of the body, and executive function. The ability to mentally experiment with ideas, pause before acting, meet new or unexpected problems, resist temptation, and maintain attention are all examples of executive functions. The next two pages, we have helpful visuals of where these lobes are located and their function. All right, so here in blue, you can see that the frontal lobe, this is where the higher level cognitive functions occur. To the bottom of the image here, you can see the temporal lobe in this mint green color, and that helps process auditory information from the environment, also with storing and recollecting memories. Here on the back portion of this image, you can see in green, the occipital lobe, and this is known for receiving information from the eyes and to make sense of visual information. All right, and here we can see the pituitary gland. It's a very small gland here, but very important in our hormones in our body. It also has a key role in our sleep cycle, our blood pressure, and regulating our body temperature. Right next to that, you can see the amygdala, another small area of the brain where it is known for emotional control and storing strong emotional memories. To the right here, you can see the hypothalamus where it is known for controlling energy levels. It also helps in our sleep cycle and our stress control. And in the hippocampus here, this stores uh, spatial memories and as well as um, creating new memories. Here we'll go over helpful techniques that can help you and your loved one manage common TBI behaviors and cognitive deficits. Now we'll go over some tips that may prevent agitation or confusion for your loved one. So monitoring their body language, tone, voice, gestures for sign of being agitated or fatigued or even confused are key indicators to look for. If signs are apparent, try to redirect by helping eliminate the triggers like turning down the TV, adjusting the thermostat, or asking them if they would rather do another activity. If it is around the time of day where your loved one becomes agitated due to fatigue, encourage rest time or limit demands by assisting them with the task or giving the task to someone else in the household if they're available. Also, using straightforward directions can remove the guesswork of what is expected of your loved one. For example, instead of saying, clean up the counter, provide straightforward instructions and say, Close up the egg and milk carton, then place them on the top shelf inside the fridge. Sitting down with your loved one and determining a daily schedule can bring them a sense of accomplishment and clarity. Once established, place the schedule in a common area like the kitchen or on their smartphone calendar where they can also get reminders of what they need to do on a daily basis. If you're aware of any short-term changes to their schedule, let them know prior or earlier during the day so your loved one is aware as sudden unannounced changes may trigger upset. Set boundaries ahead of time of what you will accept or not accept, but consistently stand by those boundaries. Here are some tips in setting your personal boundaries. So check in with yourself before you sense you're approaching your physical or emotional limits. If you're approaching or feeling at your limit, ask for help or seek help from, prof from professionals or family members. Reiterate your boundaries and stick by them. It is okay to say no to protect your own mental health. Remember that consistency is key in upholding your boundaries for others to learn what you will accept and not accept. Schedule some weekly self-care, even if it's only five minutes a day. Then add more time once it's available to you. Document any changes in behavior or patterns you have seen in your loved one and share them with your loved one's care team so they can come up with strategies or interventions that may help. Here are some strategies in managing a conflict. I would like to credit the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services as they have provided these strategies. To remember these steps, I use the SIA acronym. The S stands for STOP. Stop or pause even for a few seconds before responding or excuse yourself if it's safe to do so. Do not take their behavior personally and recognize it's not about you. Slow your mov uh, movements down and have warm facial expression 
show concern and speak slowly and calmly. Know that some survivors are unaware or unable to filter these behaviors due to underlying physical reasons. Once anger outbursts occur, now is not the time to try to have your loved one understand your view. Give yourself and your loved one a cooling off period, then address the behavior once you both are calm and well rested. Distract yourself with anything that will help you cool down, like taking a short walk, taking deep breaths, stretching, or even watching a comedy on Netflix. I stands for identify the triggers. This can be done by referring to your ABCs. A stands for antecedent, which means what happened before. B stands for behavior. Is it appropriate or inappropriate? C stands for consequence, the result of the behavior. This is the best way to gather key information to prevent another occurrence. Assume there is an underlying reason behind the behavior. They may be having a hard time processing their needs into words. Or as mentioned previously, the environment, physical symptoms, side effects from medications, or their current emotion can be leading to this behavior. Watch for obvious signs of pain, such as clenching a body part, crying, or visual signs of confusion. A stands for taking action. Provide feedback of the situation by starting with a positive comment. I see how hard you've been working lately, but I can tell you are feeling frustrated. Let's take a break and watch your favorite show together. Adaptation is the act of changing or modifying a task or the environment to support one's success in completing the task at hand. Adapting requires creativity and open mind and working together with your loved one or with their care team. Here are tips in learning how to adapt. So adapting in the moment can take time to get used to. Here are some questions that can help you get comfortable with the process. Does it or will it hurt anyone to do it? Once you have determined a safe idea, communicate with your loved one and try it out. Once you try the ideas, assess if your loved one is experiencing pain or discomfort. If so, stop immediately and go back to the drawing board. Here are some ideas that you can try at home. You can break a uh, task down to smaller steps by creating step-by-step -step checklists by listing all of the steps of doing the laundry. Be flexible in how you care for your loved one as this will help avoid conflict. If it's safe to do so, give your loved one an opportunity to start or complete the task on their own. Provide assistance only after your loved one demonstrates difficulty. Again, if it's safe to do so, give them some space. Hovering over them can make them feel uncomfortable or less confident in their abilities. Keep an open mind as there's no one size fits all solution. Provided here are coping strategies for problematic behaviors in social settings. Talk to family members and friends of these behaviors before any event. Plan a cool down area during family parties so your loved one has a safe place to recoup. If conversation dips towards the inappropriate end, try to redirect to a positive or interacting, uh, interesting topic. Work together with your loved one in creating a signal for when they forget to filter their actions in social situations. It can be as easy as saying a key word, giving them a shoulder tap, a gentle hand squeeze, or even a swift back rub. Once rehearsed, establish a boundary with your loved one if the signal goes ignored, such as stop the activity immediately, leave the event early, or leave the room momentarily. Avoid comparing your loved one's behavior to their pre-injury self. Bring an emphasis to the positive behaviors your loved one displays now and provide feedback using the sandwich method. By beginning with a genuine praise, then providing clear, constructive feedback, then following up with encouragement. For example, you did a good redirecting your conversation with the signal we practiced. I noticed you had a hard time turn taking when talking to your sister. I think waiting until the other person's mouth stops moving can be a good signal to know when to start talking again. You've been making good progress and I am confident you'll get even better with practice. Another option would be to create a brain injury identification card for your loved one to take with them when they meet new people who are not aware of the common symptoms of TBI. Encourage them to join a TBI support group to practice social skills with those who truly understand. Here are some tips in encouraging initiation in your loved one. Ask what are some activities they would like to do on a daily basis. If their choices are unrealistic, provide three reasonable options. Using step-by-step -step checklists for these activities will not only help them complete activities in order, 
but give them a visual sense of accomplishment as they check off the boxes. If they are reluctant to start new activities, start them together so they can feel at ease working through the difficult aspects with you. Encourage them to volunteer or join religious group if they're interested. Sometimes providing comfort can go a long way with your loved one's confidence. Only give genuine praise by praising actual progress they have made. If it's safe to do so, give your undivided attention to your loved one. Face them, nod, and provide eye, eye contact as a way to let them know their opinions matter. If they need time to vent their frustrations, ask if they would like you to listen or if they are looking for advice. Validate your loved one when they express their feelings like saying, I see how much this is bothering you. Thank you for opening up to me. How can I help? Offering things that com comfort your loved one like soothing music, turning on their favorite show, a warm blanket, or holding a pet can make a huge difference. Offer a hug, back rub, or holding hands can be what they need or what you need in that moment. Here's some tips in helping your loved one with short-term memory loss. Using a whiteboard that lists all events of the week can be a game changer for your loved one. Scheduling reminders into your loved one's phone or using a shared calendar like the Cozy Family Organizer app, which we have referenced at the end of this presentation. Using smartphone tools such as note-taking apps, voice memos, recording themselves taking their medication throughout the day using their phone's camera, or using medication reminder app are a great way to have your loved one remember important daily events. Storing commonly used items in the same spot, labeling cupboards or drawers, or using post-it notes and daily pill organizers are all great low-cost options. Also, utilizing contact pictures in their phone can help them remember the important people in their lives. Or placing pictures of memorable events in the common areas, such as their bedroom or living room, are a great idea. Here are some helpful tips in supporting your loved one's attention. So keep distraction at a minimum while your loved one is working on a task by eliminating unnecessary noise or visual distraction like turning off the TV. Eliminate clutter by only having the essential items for the task out. For example, only having the cook cooking utensils and necessary ingredients out while, pre while preparing dinner. If controlling the noise level may be out of your control, such as having pets, living in a busy area, or having young children, earplugs or noise canceling headphones are a good low cost option. Storing similar items together, like having oral care items in one shelf of the medicine cabinet, storing their t-shirts in one drawer, or designating one cabinet for snacks is um, another option. Avoid multitasking by breaking down tasks one at a time, such as making a note to put the first load of dirty clothes in the washer before doing the dishes. Have, you, have your loved one talk out the steps out loud or talk out the steps together. This will help them problem solve through the steps and follow the steps in order. That concludes our first module. The key takeaways are, don't take it personal. And remember that these behaviors are caused through physical changes brought on by a brain injury. Know your limits. Trial and error is key to finding what works. And keep an open mind. There is no one size fits all. It may take some time to find what truly works, but keeping that open mind and being flexible is key. At this time, we kindly ask that you complete our second survey for this module. It should only take about one minute to complete, and you can either access the survey through scanning the QR code or accessing the link in the description box below. At this time, we would like to thank all the brain injury researchers and brain injury websites that have compiled information that were used to create this module. So here are some free apps that you can download on your phone or tablet. If you or your loved one are in immediate danger, please contact 911, or you can also reference these safety resources. This module was created by Vanessa Rivera, an occupational therapy doctorate student at West Coast University Center for Graduate Studies and doctor intern at Neuropraxis Rehab under the supervision of Christine Weaver, the CEO and founder of Neuropraxis Rehab and an occupational therapist with over 29 years of experience in the brain injury rehab setting. This module's material is for information and support and not a substitute for a doctor or healthcare team advice for you or your loved one.